By the way, if you ever are watching a video, let me know if anybody's watching the videos, if that's a decent angle on that bad boy. All right, just let me know. Okay. This semester I'm saying bad boy a lot. I've got to stop doing that. Um, so the very first thing I want to do, well, well, first off, any questions from anything you guys work on? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay, so one thing we do have to talk about, what do you, and I sort of talked about this a little bit. What does this symbol mean here? <coughs> Sigan? That's the prime symbol. What does it mean? Slope. Slope. So it's the rate of change of the function. Yes? So what do you think this symbol might mean? Slope of the slope. So it's how much the slope is changing. So for example, um, they don't tell me which is which, do they? Oh, they do. So, well, they tell me the graph of a function and this derivative. So the very first thing you have to do is figure out which one was the original function and which one is its derivative, right? That's kind of like the first level of this. So red or blue, which one is the original? Red. If the red is the original, where should the blue be here? Yeah. The blue should go through zero there. Do you guys, I really want you to pick up on what I'm saying here because there will be several problems like this where they're like, tell me which thing is which. Which is f, which is f prime, which is f double prime. Did you, do you understand what I just said? So if the original function was this, the slope better go through zero there, and it doesn't. So if this is the original function, what should the slope be here? Zero, okay. What should the slope be here? Zero, what should it be there? Zero. So it looks like blue is the original, okay. Anybody have trouble with what, what I just said? Because that's the very first step of this problem is, which is which? What's up? Oh, no. You're I, good? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. A negative shake of the head always makes me oh, concerned. Oh, like, no, I don't have Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So assuming everybody's good with that. So let me just write in my book, original. Okay. So F prime at negative 1. So at negative 1, blue is original. So here's F prime at negative 1. F prime is negative, yes? See it here, you can see it here. Okay, I like it. And by the way, this is not easy, right? This kind of thing is not easy. It's sort of like when I, we were doing the problems where you had to trace out what the slope looked like just from the original graph, right? You had to keep reminding yourself what you were doing. And you have to keep checking, okay, the slope should be negative, so I better be graphing down here. You guys kind of with me? Of course, you plot the anchor points, the zero slopes. You plot those first. Are you guys actually with me? Yes. And that is not easy. Every time you got to do that, you got to remind yourself what you're doing. Okay. Here, this is sort of like that. Somebody's done it for us. Somebody's already graphed the slope for us. But so we got to be looking at this correctly. So f prime of negative one, we can see from the original it's negative. It's actually the most negative it could be. Now, let me see. F double prime. Here's the reason why they were kind of nice by giving me f prime. I, I, Theoretically, what do you think about this statement? Can you take the derivative of almost any function? Can you find the slope of almost any function? What do you think? Yes. Notice how I said almost, because you know there's going to be functions that are functions. But most functions, you can find the slope, because it's got to be going somewhere. Even if it's not a function, do you think I could find? Like a circle is not a function, correct? Do you think there's a slope at every point? Of course there is. So I can even do derivatives of non-functions. Of course I can. So, 
when I take the derivative of a function, what kind of thing do I get back? Do I necessarily get a number back? What kind of thing do I get back? If I take the derivative of a function, what kind of thing do I get back? That's a really strange question, I know. Another function, kick ass. I get another function. And what did we just say? Can we take the derivative of almost any function? Doesn't it feel like we should be able to, yes? So of course if I get a freaking derivative, it is a function itself. I should be able to take its derivative also. In fact, how many times can I do this? Theoretically forever. Forever. Like, maybe? Some functions, it'll become zero. But then I would argue, you can take for derivatives forever and it just stays zero. So, yeah. ah, gotcha. Uh, I know shit. All right. Now, f double prime at one. So here's the original, right? Here's the derivative. What is the derivative of the derivative at one? What is the derivative of the derivative? Doesn't look to be, it looks to be just about zero. There, there would be a little evil there, but doesn't it look to be just about zero? If not zero, it's a little positive, wouldn't you say it looks like? This one, f prime and negative one, was negative. The slope of the red line here is at least zero, it's not positive, so then the question is easy. You just had to understand. And why were they nice here? They were nice because they gave me the graph of f prime. So then I could just look at it to think about its slope, which would be officially f double prime. Oh, boy, you guys are excited about this. All right. Yes? So the answer is? I'm not going to say. If you've been paying attention, you can just get the answer easy. Okay. Anything else? Is that good? Oh, you had two more, didn't you? Yeah, that's 51. Uh, let's see. Well, I'm zoomed in. Oh, yeah. So, there's a few different answers to this. One answer is very simple because they actually build on this idea that I started last time. These are the kind of places where a function is not differential. This is the one we talked about. The book calls it a corner, right? We're not afraid to call that a kink. Right? It's a kink in the hose, yes? Or however you want to think of it. A function is not differentiable at a discontinuity, which makes sense, because how is a function defined? And somebody remind me the definition of Derivative. How is it not a function, but a derivative? How is a derivative defined? The slope of a point on a function. Sure. Be more technical. F of a plus a. What comes before what you're saying? Limit, limit as h goes to zero. Goes to zero. Yeah. Does it say h has to be positive? Does it say h has to be negative? So it's from both directions, yes? So why then does it make sense that it's not differentiable here? because the limit from both directions doesn't necessarily agree, right? So it's not differentiable if the function itself is discontinuous. Is this function continuous here? Yes, I love it. But the derivative would not be continuous. What's the slope on one side of that? Right. Well, I mean, this really gets funky because it's infinite, really. Yeah! All right. So this is not differentiable. That's not differentiable. And this one is a little weird, but what kind of slope will it have right there? Un well, infinite, undefined, I love it. So then we officially say it's not differentiable. Then. All right, let me stop for a minute. So, coming back to the actual question, one reason this is has an easy answer, which is sort of like the answer I wouldn't want, but I'd have to take it, is what does this look like at six? What does this look like at six? <laughs> there you go, kink. Yes, corner, if you want to call it a corner. So 
by the definition, that's not different. But they say show it's not differentiable. So one way you could do that is, what is this function for values below 6? What is this? Or let me say this. For, func for values above 6, what is that function equal? I love you guys. Remember absolute values? When do they do something? When the number's below 0. Right, that's inside. If I put a value above 6 in there, what kind of number is it? Will the absolute value do anything? So above 6, this is x minus 6, which has a slope of 1. So f prime would be 1 above 6. Below 6, this what happens to this? It's also x minus 6. It's also x minus 6? No. Below 6, what kind of number is this? Negative. So what's the absolute value going to do to it? Change its sign. How do you change something's sign? You make them be born on a different day. No. What? what? <laughs> Multiply by negative 1. So, so below 6, what is this then? It's negative x plus 6. What's its slope? So do the slopes agree at 6? No. So that's the more technical way. I went too far there. Basically gave you the answer if you're paying attention. Right, and then what's it say next? Oh yeah, find a formula for f prime. I basically we just basically did that. I don't know if you were paying attention. We did an example of an absolute value all the way through, if I remember correctly. So this is the same exact idea. We'll find out who is paying attention. Okay, what was the last one? Oh yeah, so even and odd. Ooh, this is really cool. All right, I don't want to say much about this. So they remind you what even means, they remind you what odd means, and they want to know if you have an even function. It says prove, so you know this is a true statement, but you've got to figure out how to show that's true. And this is section 2.8, so all we know about derivatives is the limit definition. So that's probably going to come in somehow. And that's all I'm going to say. So that one I'm going to let you guys think about it. So if that's the only problem you have trouble with when you turn, you're about to turn your homework and you're fine. That's, this one's a little bit freaky, but still think about it. Uh, yes? 30? Oh, yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Did you do 27? Did I assign 27? Yes. Okay. 30 is the same thing. Why? It's, it's, it's almost the same thing. It's a little bit more disgusting because of the third power. It's a, it's a radical also. So it's going to work in much the same way as 27. What you what'd you have to do in 27? If you did 27, there was a certain thing you had to do. Multiply by the Conjugate, okay. Yeah. Same thing's going to happen here. Uh, so the number is just going to be a third of one, like the, when it's cubed, whatever, you have to cube it. I wouldn't cube it early. Okay. Yeah, that's the trick. Don't apply the powers early. All right. Wait, so keep it in three halves for at, at the beginning, apply the conjugate, and then worry about it. Yeah, so try it out. Okay, um, anything else? All right, so real quick, I want to investigate something. I don't want to investigate you. I want to investigate you. Okay. One little thing I didn't talk about in section 2.8. Actually, it's before section 2.8, to be honest, so let's just knock this thing out. So if you want to follow along, if you have a graphing calculator. If not, you're okay. You just watch. Um, Sine x is really, really interesting for values near zero. And, and I'm actually get I don't know why I've got it in here. I'm going to just do it here. So if you got your calculators, make sure you're in radians, dear God. Okay. Right? Make sure you're in radians. And then do this. What is sine 
of 0.1. You guys get that. Yes, everybody? Just make sure everybody's in the right mode. What is 0.0998 if I round it to one decimal place? Interesting. So do sine of 0.01. Is this where it starts to freak out a little bit? No, it shouldn't. So what do you guys get? 0 0.00999. And that's definitely even closer to rounding to be 0 0.01, correct? So what is sine of, I don't know, can you guess what I'm going to do next? I'm so predictable, I know. It's too bad. Now, does anyone understand what that means? I think we went over this before, did we? What is that? Good, times 10 to the... So that means you would move this back. One, two, three, four. So it'd be point oh 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 nine 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 nine, which rounds to be point oh oh one. So what would your conjecture be Ooh. about the value of sine for inputs close to zero? No, I didn't say the limit as it goes to zero. I said values close to zero. What does the output... What is conjecture? Oh, conjecture is like hypothesis, guess, right? Yes? Closer they, they get to zero, they equal to each other. Okay, I, I understand what you mean. The closer the input gets to zero, the closer the output of sine is to the input. Another way to say that is sine x is approximately equal to x when you get really close to zero. Has anyone taken any physics? Yeah. Did you ever talk about pendulums and small angles? Yes. Didn't you already do sine theta as approximately theta? Yes. This is what? Okay, I want to okay. Now, if you didn't take physics, don't worry. I'm sorry, we just had a little conversation. Thank you. Um, so, what this means is, if that's true, what do you think is true about, it's not really a proof, but it's good enough for us at the moment. We'll be able to prove it later. What do you guys think about this? Jeez. Why am I doing that? Let's just do this. Limit as x goes to 0, sine x over x. What did we just say? The closer x gets to 0, the more this output becomes x. So this limit should be 1. Yes? All right, and that's true. That limit is 1, which really just makes sense because the closer x gets to 0, the closer sine x gets to x, the more the output becomes what the input was. And it makes sense because what's sine of 0? Freaking 0. So they're exactly equal at 0, but of course the ratio freaks out. But if I just don't let it get to 0, that looks like it's trying to go to 1. Let me stop for a minute. Now... Um, yeah, let's hold that in our bag of known things. And actually, watch this. This is kind of cool. What do you think this is then? Let me be really careful there. Also one. also one. The closer x gets to zero, the closer sine of 5x gets to 5x. The closer the output becomes the input. Yes? Okay, now, let me see if anybody can get this. Is everybody cool with that? No. If you're cool with this, you have to be cool with that. So what is wrong with this then? What's kind of wrong and can we fix it? Do we know what that's going to be the way it's written? Well, that's a good guess. Well, why the shit would that be true? How can you show that? What do we need down here? And this is a very useful skill, stupid useful skill that's going to become really important when we get to the opposite of differentiation. And by the way, you should realize, every time you learn a new math function, don't you very soon afterwards learn its opposite? So we are talking about derivatives, taking the derivative of something. There is an opposite of that kind of non-creatively called anti-derivative at first. Is there a long way to do that? Say again? Is there a long way to do that? Yes, and you guess what? Uh, yeah. Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> I'm going to make a long way. 
I know you should be, right? And it's real, it's even better than limit. You're gonna be like, God, please let me do a definitional limit again. Jeff got this, you guys can So this skill right now. Can I are you guys cool with the fact that I could just do this? Does anybody have a problem with me doing that? Isn't that true? Yes, all those limit uh, properties we discussed. Yeah. I can yeah. totally just do that shit, right? And what do I want to be here? No, no, no. I want a five to be there, right? If I put a five here, what do I have to do at the same time? If I divide by five, I better multiply by five. So somebody's guess came out to be correct, right? So this is five fourths, and what's this limit? One. So that's five fourths. Kabam. So there are some problems like that where you have to balance it out. As long as the argument of the sign is the same as the bottom, that ratio becomes one. If they're not, that ratio is not one then. It's been thrown off a little bit. And you can figure out exactly what it is by building inside what you need. Yes? Are you cool right here? Do you see how I took out a one four? Yeah. Is that cool? So to balance this out, I, I, all I really did was I multiply the bottom by five and the top by five. That's all I did. Because don't I want the denominator to be five x? You see that? So it matches with this. So, say again. Anything, anywhere, any anything, anywhere, I can multiply top and bottom by something that's not zero. Oh, yes, they have to be. Because what did I really just do here? I just multiplied by one. Five over five. And I could have put the five here, maybe I should have, but then it would just move right out because it's a constant, so the limit that's not going to care about that piece. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. I was going to do, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll hold on to that. All right. Now that we know this, well, let's see, why not? Let's do it. All right. And while I do this, I can kind of introduce some different symbols. So what if f of x is sine x, and I want to know what f prime of x is? So let me, let me show you some different symbols for f prime that we're going to see. So another symbol for f prime is this symbol, d by dx. Remind me what f prime is. Slope. Now go back to algebra. What is the basic definition of slope? Rise over run. Now, now spell that out for me. Now, now, now make that more wordy. The change in y's. Divided by the change in x's, yes? So this, remember the delta, the little upside down, not upside down, but the little triangle? And I think most of you guys remember that meant change in, and that is the Greek letter delta. No? All right, let me, let me lay this out right now. This symbol here, where can I put you? This symbol here meant change in. And very often, uh, some of you guys have seen the slope as change in y over change in x. Okay, now stay with me. This symbol means a big step. A big step could be 0. .0000001. That is huge. That is a freaking gigantic step compared to how small it could be. We all should be very well aware of that. Right? We let things get as close to zero as freaking possible. So 0. .0001 is miles away from zero. Are you guys cool with that statement? So this statement here means a large step, a gross step, not gross as in uh, okay. The D means the smallest step possible. 
So this little d means that change, but you applied the limit as it went to zero. That's what the D symbol means. So that's why it's a D, because it's like delta, which is the Greek letter D. D. Okay, maybe? Are you guys semi with me? So this beautiful notation, I think this is leanness notation, this captures the idea that this is a slope. And it brought into, um, there, there's, I, I don't know how much you guys probably aren't aware of this, but Newton and Leibniz are the two that developed most of the ideas of calculus. Newton kind of sat on his stuff for a few years before he published it. Leibniz just put that shit out immediately. So there's always this argument about who should get the credit. And you're all like, I don't care. <laughs> These people are dead. All right, no. This is related to the idea of infinitesimals. Infinitesimals. which is kind of like very, very stupid, the smallest step over and the smallest step up possible. And there was a lot of disagreement in the math world at the time whether or not these actually existed. To use them as kind of an idea of what's going on is perfectly valid, right? It almost doesn't matter if they exist or not, to be honest. Okay, I don't know how much you guys are with me or not. But doesn't it make sense? If I let h go to zero, that is the smallest possible step over and the smallest possible step up. That is what that means. Okay. All right. There's some other symbols, too, that we're not going to see this semester. You might see it in the future if you take some higher level math. There's a big ass d, which is like an operator. So like you do a square root symbol and you have the f of x in it. This is like a derivative operator. You're not, we're not going to see this here any more than that. And there's some other ones I'm not going to throw at you. Okay, These are the two we're definitely going to see throughout the semester. Okay. All right. All right. There's a major side note. How would I set up the, the work for this to figure this out? What would the work look like? Using the definition of derivative, the limit as... You can do a definition of derivative. The limit as h goes to zero. <laughs> Let me just write it out. f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. What is f of x plus h? Sine of x plus h minus sine of x all over h. Okay, that looks like we can't really do much with this, correct? Okay, I agree. Now, we do something really, really funky. Let me see. As I'm writing, I'm trying to remember exactly which way this goes. You could do it, Jeff. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, let me see. How am I going to remember? I'm pretty sure that's correct. Let me make sure. That's weird. Shit. Just sit on that for a minute. I should have looked this up before. I always forget which thing goes where. This, this is a weird... Um, proof method that I doubt any of you would come up with by yourself until you've seen it a couple times. Oh, I can't remember where this is. Where was this? This has got to be here. Do, 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 do. Where are you, sign? Or am I doing it too early? I thought it was already here. I might be throwing this at you too early. Oh, I can't remember where you are. I thought, okay, wait a minute. Sorry, guys. I wanted to throw this at you because I thought for sure it was in section 2.8, but now I don't see it. Why did 
but I think it wasn't too late. Let's see. Well, maybe it's not a two way. All right. All right. All right. All right. I thought for sure. Okay, I thought for sure I saw it in two eight. So I was like, I better throw this at them now. But maybe not quite yet. Maybe it's coming up in trig later. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and make sure. I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. This is very. Now let me just say this. Did I just do something legal? Because what did I just add? Zero. zero. I'm not going to add zero to anything I want to, right? But for example, um, oh, I see what I'm missing. All right, this is not quite right. Okay, good. I need to look this up anyway. Uh, this is not quite right, but anytime I want to, I can add and subtract the same thing, and, and we're about to do something that involves this, which is one reason why I wanted to do this, and then I forgot to look up exactly what needs to go there. So that kind of sucks. So this we're gonna do later when we do trig derivatives. I thought for sure it was in section 2.8, so I didn't wanna pass it by. We'll come back to that later. Okay, let's do this. Um, what we saw last time, so basic derivatives. Definitely. And we sort of got into three and one last time a little bit. Can somebody tell me, can somebody just tell me what this is here? What would F prime be for that? Without doing any work. Totally, because F prime means slope. So why would you do a ton of work when you can just look at it and tell what the slope is? What about this? Uh, what if G of X is negative two, what's G prime? Zero, it's a flat line, right? So that derivative is zero, I love it. We also noticed last time I had a cubic and then we drew over it its slope and it looked like a squared. So the idea of the power stepping down by one makes sense, we can see this right now. What's the power, what's the degree of this? One, what's the degree of this? Zero. So the power sort of stepped down by one. And we saw that with the x cubed, it looks like the answer was related to x squared. The power stepped it down by one. So that's probably gonna be a part of derivatives of polynomials. Now, let me see. I think, didn't I last time do, I'm pretty sure last time I did, this is why I gotta keep my notes better. Yeah. No, maybe not. Did we not do this? If f of x was this, didn't we do this? Yeah. Yes, good. And what was the derivative at the end? Yeah, which is neat. That part makes total sense. That slope is b. This doesn't make immediate sense to some of us yet, but it looks like the two just came down. And sure enough, it went from second degree to first degree, right? Okay, I like it. Now, so what if I had something like, let's just start off nice. What if I had something like this? Uh, sure, I like it. Actually, let me start off even better. Let me start off even better. Sorry, guys. Let's do this. What if I had this? Yes. Are you? Yeah. No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Because you guys have memorized the answer. I don't give a shit about that. I don't give the first shit. So the next step will be memorization, but right now the step is why does it work? That is more important than memorization. Okay. So go with me here. Are you excited about this? Do you understand what this means is going to happen? What's going to be on the top of this? Yes. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Not only is that not squared or something, it's not even defined, Jeff. What kind of shit is that? Minus 
x to the n over h. Now, I don't want to get overly technical. There's actually a really cool thing that I sort of showed you. Remember Pascal's triangle and how it related to the coefficients of stuff? Do you guys remember that? I don't know. There is one thing I really want you guys to remember about that right now. Um, let's see. Let me do a little side note. I almost feel like I should apologize every time about your notes, however you do your notes. Side note. <laughs> so you remember when we were doing something like this? Uh, like that. Right? And we want to do it really quickly. We have a little Pascal's triangle. Oh, a little Pascal's triangle. What's up? What's the point? Oh, the voice? I have no idea, dude. It's like me saying these bad boys, and I got the voices. Just you guys, I'm sorry. Just got to deal with it. Whatever med I'm not taking, I should probably start taking it. All right. Really quickly, x plus two to the zero power is one, correct? X plus two to the first power is one x and one two, correct? I mean, so that sort of starts off. You can see how it starts off correctly. All right, the thing I want you to realize, which, which row am I gonna use for the result, the, the coefficients of this? This one. This is zero power, first power, second power, third power. So that means I'm gonna have one x cubed. Does anyone remember how to, then I'm gonna have three what's? Well, all right, all right, hold on. We're gonna have three times two x's and one two. So this is the idea I really want you to understand right now. And again, if you just do the foiling, you'll get the same answer. We're not done, obviously. So it starts off with nothing but x's. Lose an x, pick up a two. That's the coefficient. Next step, lose an x, pick up another two. Three is the coefficient. One x now and two twos. I love that idea like this, right? Because at the end, it's all going to be twos. That's where you just multiply the last two, the last two like three times. So it'll be one, no x's, nothing but twos. So if you actually did this, you'll get x cubed plus 6x squared plus 12x plus 8. That is trying to be a 3. Okay. So what the shit does that have to do with our problem? Well... You guys ready? Okay. Yep. Let's see if I can tunnel through this. Wouldn't this then be, I have no idea where I am in here, do I? Because it's an nth power, I, I, I'm anywhere. But I know it's gonna start off with what? you know it's going to start off with x to the n plus some number, right? Some number. Wherever I am in there, it's going to be that coefficient. You with me? Okay, maybe. One less x, right? One less x. And then an h. Stay with me. Is everybody with me so far? And then it's just going to start to... So, I really want you to understand... All right, let me, let me keep going. Plus... Now, now, this is a little important. What do you think this is going to be? For the third power, it's 3. For the second power, it's 2. So, for the nth power, what number is this going to be? N. All right. Let me stop for a minute. I love you guys so much. I, I can see it in your eyeballs. I, I know some of you guys know how to do derivatives, and you're all like, oh my God, it's so easy, Jeff. I don't give a shit. It does end up being easy, but you have to see why it works. Then the next thing is going to be some number times one less x times one more h, correct? Every other term is going to have more and more and more freaking h's, correct? Why is that important? Because what am I going to do at the end? I'm going to let H go to zero. So all the other shit is just... So plus more and more H's. H cubed. 
page four. Blah, blah, all the way. Over H. Minus, sorry, I forgot this guy. Minus X to the N. So this cancels with this, yes? And what's the next thing you do? Doesn't this feel, isn't this how most of your limit problems with derivatives worked? You did the top, you waited till the H's could die. Anything that had an H in it still at the end dies because you're letting H go to zero. So what's the only piece of this? Is this still gonna have an H? Yeah, is that, yeah, everything after this is still gonna have an H. This is the only piece that doesn't have an H in it. So when you let H go to zero, that's the only piece that's gonna be left. Yes? Maybe? Okay. So this died because it canceled with this. This H cancels. Everything else has at least one H left. So when I let H go to zero, all that's left is this. So what is it? what does it look like happened? It started off like this. So what happened? What's the shortcut here? X to the N. When I take a derivative, what does this do? Comes down here, and then one less in the exponent. So we're fine. Oh my God. Some of you guys should be like, oh, thank God. Oh, we've made it. I can now do polynomial shit easy. I don't have to do limit definition anymore because we basically just did every polynomial. And because there's one thing we still got to talk about. But um, so, for example, let's see how this works. If I have g of x is uh, yeah, x to the seventh plus g prime of x, seven x to the sixth. What if I have h of x is 2x to the 11th? What would h prime be? Right, of course, right? Because the 11 comes down. There's already a 2 there. x to the 10th. Jeff? I like it. What about uh, if I have f of x is, this is 1, Two, three. f of x equals x to the negative 3. What's f prime? Good. Fight the urge to make that negative 2. That makes it bigger. You always have to take one away. It's got to get smaller. I like it. And then what about this? This should feel like we, we can't do this yet, but actually this, this rule applies here also. The one half comes down, x to the, good. And watch this, this is gonna be so cool. You gotta let this be cool. When you're taking derivatives of fractional exponent things, that comes down. What's 1 minus 2? Negative 1. Does that always work, Jeff? Of course it does. Why? Because when you subtract 1, don't you have to make it the same as the denominator? So now you're subtracting 2 over 2. So you are doing 1 minus frickin' 2. So the denominator is what would become the top of the minus one. That's why it's a shortcut. So for example, I really want you guys with this. If I had this, well, let's throw something out front just to make it even better. X to the negative uh, three fourths. I like it. I always do this eight times. The negative three fourths comes down. What's negative three minus four? I'm done. Well, I'm not done. I still gotta multiply by eight, but isn't that cool? Yes, negative three minus four is negative seven over four, done. Because I would subtract one, I've gotta make the bottom and the top four, so I am subtracting four from three. That's, that's why the shortcut works. It kicks so much ass. 
And of course, so the answer would actually be negative 6x to the negative 7 fourths. Could you then do this? <laughs> of course you could, right? What would happen? Negative 6 times negative 7 fourths x to the negative 7 minus 4. And then you multiply this shit, and then I ask you to do the third derivative. How long could you do that for? Until you go insane. Because after you go insane, I'm not sure if the work's going to match. I'm not sure what's going to happen then. Maybe you'll understand math even better. I don't know. All right, so we've got to balance that out some understanding with insanity. OK. So let me, let me see if that's, oh, that's right, Jeff. All right. It's on this sheet here, the, the, the sign thing that I was doing earlier. It's on my sheet. I love you, Jeff. So I already did the damn thing, so now you can see how it's supposed to be done. Oh, I'm being so stupid. All right, so let me totally own up to my stupidity. All right. I always want to show off. Get out of here, stupid shit. So after we do this little handout, I'm going to kind of step a little bit into the next section, which is going to involve this kind of thing here, right, where we have to add and subtract something. I am, I really, really, really am upset with myself right now because this is kind of big in terms of trig stuff. If I would have just slowed down and thought about it for a second. Do we have an identity for sine of x plus h? Yes. By the way, real quick, um, yet another side note. Jeff and his eternal search for paper. All right, so here's the test. So we got that written down. Um, so what is sine of a plus b versus cosine of a plus b? So real quick, have I said this yet? Cosine is an asshole. Cosine is an asshole, right? What, what do I mean by that? Right, you're all like, I don't know what you mean, like three fifths of the time, Jeff. Sorry. Sine says, oh, let's take turns, cosine. I'll do one, you do the other one. Yay. Oh, you got a plus sign? Okay, I'll, make, I'll leave it as plus. Yay, now it's your turn to have the A cosine. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Cosine, look what cosine does. It's all about me, me first. Screw you, sign. It's all me. Oh, you got a plus sign? I don't give a shit. Now you get a turn sign at the end. Blech. All right. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. I have no idea. The beautiful thing about this cosine is an asshole is I keep figuring out more and more things that actually follow that rule that cosine is an asshole. Sine is like, let's just get along. You go, I'll go. Let's not, and the cosine is me. Anyway, sorry. So, knowing that, what is sine of x plus h? It'd be sine x, cosine h, plus sine h, cosine x. Now watch this, this is cool. What's the limit as h goes to zero of this? I can just do it, can't I? What's cosine of zero? Zero. zero. I like it. So this would go to zero, is that cool? You with me? What did we just talk about earlier here? That's one, yes? Yes, you guys with me? Yeah, cosine of zero is one. Cosine, oh, I'm being stupid, right. thank you. Cosine of zero is one, thank you. I'm not even thinking as I'm saying this. Cosine of zero is one. Put a one there, dear God. Sine over uh, sine h over h is the limit we were just talking about earlier. That's one. And then I forget about, oh, that's right. All right, let me do this a little bit neater. I'm being silly. Hold up, guys. All right. Forget about this for a second. 
what is sine x cosine h minus sine x? Isn't that going to be, can't I take a sine x out? And that would be cosine h minus 1. This is all on this paper I'm going to give you, by the way. So there we go. Now that's why I'm thinking 0. What happens to this as h goes to 0? This becomes 0. Is that cool? Cosine of 0 is 1. Minus 1 is 0. And of course, this is 1. So the answer becomes cosine. So the slope of sine x is cosine x. What do you think the slope of cosine x is? It actually is negative sine x. Yes? Oh, because right here, can't I take a sine x out of these? And so I'm left with cosine h minus 1? Yeah, yeah. And again, it's on this paper. Let me just give this paper to you. down here. Did I remember? Yes, good. So one of the most important rules of derivatives, this kind of makes sense. If I had the limit of f plus g, can't I just do the limit of each and then add them? Right? Isn't that one of the limit rules? You guys remember? And, and what are derivatives based off of? Limits. So doesn't this first thing make sense? The slope of f plus g or minus g is the slope of each because they're both based on limits and I can just distribute the limit across both in a, in a way. And maybe. That's huge. That means every polynomial is easy because you just look at each piece, something to a power, easy. Something to a power, easy. And you just do each piece separately. Then of course, this one we already talked about, the derivative of constant is zero, of course. Here's something we kind of did already where I can take the C out the way. That's a limit, so it can kind of go inside. right? Remember that limit rule? And then, of course, this is the big one. This is the one we proved. Uh, and here's a better write-up of what we just did. Actually, I think I did it differently there. I can't remember. And then here, let's try to do some of these. These should be pretty quick, I think. Try to do these real quick here. Oh yeah, that's even better, Jeff. I like that better. These should be, if you get it, you're done. If you don't get it, you're not done. All right, let's take a look. So what's A here? Yeah, that kicks so much ass. So where are my people that already knew that rule? Aren't you happy we finally made it here? All right. We're not quite done with the limit definition. It's going to come back a few times. Yeah. But we're, we're a lot more done with it than we were. 
Part B is not too bad, right? This one, you just look at them as all as four separate problems. Yes, that's what this first thing does for me. So I'm just going to write this down. 16x7, 9x squared, plus 2. Right, is everybody cool with that? Where would the negative 9 go? The derivative of a constant is 0. I love it. Another way to look at that real quick. I have no idea if this is going to screw anybody up, but I, I apparently don't care. Um, couldn't I write negative 9? Isn't that the same as this? Sorry. You guys agree with me? And now this kind of makes more sense as to why a zero power makes it one. Negative nine means I have a negative nine and I have no x's. That's exactly what that means. What would the derivative do? Zero times I don't care is zero. Done. Did I really need to do that? We all know the derivative of a constant is zero because it's flat. But still, I want to show you how that still follows the rule. Okay. What about this bad boy here? There it is again, bad boy. I like it. Some of you guys are in stereo. I love it. This one's easy. Good. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. That's a quick way to do that. Here's where I get really nifty answers. We have no rule right now for a function inside of another function. We don't have a rule for that yet. You should understand that that's going to be worse. Do I have to treat this like that, though? Is there a way to rewrite this? Yes. 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 How? Good. Right? Powers on top. Powerful. Top. Roots on the bottom, like most plants. My botanists out there don't hold tubers, actually. And shut up. <laughs> roots are on the bottom. Most uh, that actually happened. That was a true story. I said roots are on the bottom, like all plants. And they're like, no, it's uh, tubers are. Oh, jeez, oh, all right. So roots on the bottom, powers on the top. Easy. And now I can do the derivative very simply. No, it's no, seven. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Two sevens. Okay, I like it. I'm a math teacher. I am well aware that I'm boring. Now. What about number two? I give you the point. I'm so nice. <laughs> right? So from algebra, all I need to get this, the, the equation of the line is to find the slope. Do that. Find the slope. No, it's not bad. This is a lot easier. Just give you a little hint. If you write this, how do I rewrite 2 over x? So it's a power. 2x to the negative 1, right? So if you write it in the form of the rule, you can apply the rule directly. Okay, somebody help me out here. Good. Yeah, plus 2x to negative 2. It should be 2 over x squared. I like it. And of course, now to get the slope I want, because what does that represent again? What we just figured out? What does this represent? Slope of x. Yeah, slope of f at some point x. Some x. You with me? So in 2.7, we were being very careful and just finding the slope at some specific, let A be 1 or something. And then 2.8 said, we don't have to do that shit. We just let A be A. And now we're like, we're just going to let X be X. So this, anything I plug in, I'm going to get the slope there. So where, where is this thing not differentiable? Ooh, shit. Where is this not differentiable? Zero. Zero's not going to have a slope, right? Zero's going to be infinite slope. In fact, you guys remember what a cube root looks like? Let me see, where am I at? Or, or even better, it's not even a cube root. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's just a uh, gather. Yeah, it's this guy. 
here. So of course at zero, it's discontinuous. So the derivative is not gonna have a chance. So now what is the slope at two? That's where I'm curious about. 96.5? I'll take your word for it. Should I do that? Let's see. Yeah, I like it. And I just have to, that's not the best number in the world, but who cares? Y minus the Y piece equals M times X minus the X piece. And then you just multiply and all that kind of crap. I almost don't care. Right, the rest of that's easy. Are you guys okay out there? And again, this is a direct extension of those algebra problems that said stuff like, find the equation of the line that goes through the point 1, 7 and is parallel to the line y equals 3. You, know, you had to have a way to find the slope. You had to have a way to get a point. This is just one more way to find the slope now for these problems is derivatives. I like it. All right, I love number three. So we're going to come up to this later. I'm going to see what the hell that means. But I just want to focus on this. Where would it be horizontal? What does that mean? The tangent line is horizontal. What's happening with the function? So the tangent line is going to be horizontal. Slope is zero, which means the function is going to look like this maybe. Or it could look like this. Where it's zero just for a second. It's like, I'm going to turn. No, I'm not. Right? So it's somewhere where it kind of flattens out for, for an instant. Right? So what am I going to do to find that? So it's wherever the function's slope equals zero. So if I just get an expression for the slope, what's the expression for the slope? Say again, sorry. 3x squared plus 12x. Yummy. And of course, that I want to set equal to 0 to find everywhere where it flattens out. Please be nice to yourself and divide by 3, right? I always feel bad for my people that just start working with the problem. Like, no, divide by 3, dear God. Because the zero just eats that up. And then this is easy. Is it? So it's horizontal at negative seven and three. That's where it could be a maximum or a minimum, right? And in this case, we know it's a cubic and it's got other parts. It's most likely looks like this. So we'll have one max and one min. So later we're gonna start discussing how do I determine if it's a max or a min? Okay. So, last thing for today. Any, any questions from this, by the way? You guys okay? This is definitely nice. Now that we have a shortcut, our first definition, our first derivative shortcut. Um, okay. Last thing. Let me make sure. Was there something else I want to say here? No. Oh, that's true. Uh, I'll come back to that. Okay. What do you think about... Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. What if I had a function that was actually the product of two functions? So, I mean, for example, what if I had a function that was 
x squared times x plus 1 to the 11th. Is there a quicker way to get the derivative rather than multiplying this thing out forever, right? You could do that, couldn't you? You could make one big polynomial by sitting there and doing this over and over and over. Yes? Like, please, Jeff, let's continue this idea of shortcuts. We like this. So, before we can develop a shortcut, we have to go back to limit definition. Always. Oh, shit. So, what I want to do is figure out what this is. I want to figure out what is H prime. Now you're going to see why I was thinking incorrectly for that sign thing earlier, because this is where we're going to do that freaky ass add subtract something. So let's let's write down what this would be. What would h prime be? It would be the limit. H goes to zero. Let me see if you guys could figure out what goes in here. Let me do this. I'll do the hard part. There you go. Okay, I did half of it. You just got to do the other half, right? What's on the top? Don't tell me h of x. What is h of x? Isn't it this? So what goes here? It would be this thing with what thrown into it. What, what's the first piece of the limit definition? f of x plus h, right? So I'm, I'm going to get f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus. Are you guys okay with that? Because the function is f of x times g of x. So what is what, what do I get when I put an x plus h into it? I get that. Could you maybe capitalize the H for the function so it came up with H? Very good point. Let's capitalize this H. Should make it easier on me. Well, that would be... No, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. All right. Let me rewrite exactly what I had and then really address what you just said. Um, H prime of X. I just realized something. Okay, here's where I left off. There's no problem with anything I've written because all of these are the same H. I don't have this anywhere there. So you just mean to make this this up here, right? Okay. That I can do. What goes here? Uh, f of x, g of x. So I put an x plus h into the function that goes first, and then I just put the function itself that goes second. Okay. I like it. Now, there's no reason that you would ever necessarily know to do what I'm about to do. One thing is because when I just tried to show you, it wasn't the right time to do it, which kind of sucks. But the other thing is that it, before you've ever seen it happen, you don't even know it's an option. So part of math is just picking up all the things you're allowed to do. So this is one thing you kind of know you're allowed to do, but you never saw a purpose to it which is adding and subtracting the same thing, right? So if I rewrite this, oh yeah, this is h prime. All right, here we go. Oh, this one, I have notes, thank God, okay. Just barely, okay, oh my God. So I just rewrote that there, that there, and then I added and subtracted this shit, which again, there's no way in hell I would give you this problem and just expect you to figure out to do that, right? Especially if you've never seen it happen before. But let's see what this does for us. By the way, the book has a totally different way to do this proof. That I really don't like. This is much better. But maybe you guys can look at the book's proof if you don't like mine. Um, what can I do with those two there? Up here top. What happens? What can I do with these? Yeah. So I'm going to factor it out at the end. So kind of go along with me here. So this would be f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And I'm going to factor out the g of x plus h. All right, that's the first piece. 
Is that right? I just took that out and put it at the end. Yes. Okay, so that was the part that I tried to explain is not this here, right? Or no, on this step. Um, yeah. This step. No. Here. Yeah. All right. I introduced this, I subtracted this, and I added the exact same thing. So I just, I didn't do anything. In fact, um, no, it doesn't quite work that way trying to think of a thing you've done already that's sort of the same. I don't want to do a whole different side note, but no, you... I, I just, my eyes are my Understood. So this is there, okay. this is there, and then the middle I added zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, you could be like, how would you even know to add that version of zero? Yes? Uh, for the f of x, g of x at the end there? Say again, sorry? G of x plus h came out, f of x plus h, and f of x. And then I got more shit over here I haven't talked about yet. Oh, okay. So, okay. Plus, <laughs> right? So, so that's this piece. What can come out of these two? f of x can come out of there. And then I'm going to have uh, g of x plus h minus g of x over h. And again, I don't know how many times I could say this. There is no reason you would even think to do this. Because you don't even know. You didn't even know it was something that would be useful, let alone that you would ever want to do. And subtract the same thing. But what did I just uncover? What's the limit of this? What is this the definition of? The limit is h because the zero of this is the definition of what? The limit is h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. That is what? I heard something. Yes, f prime. Isn't that f prime? That limit is f prime. And what do I what, what do I get here when I let h go to zero? G of x. All right, let's keep going. Plus, that's just f of x. You with me? That piece doesn't give a shit h is going to zero. It's just always f of x, yes? And what at, what's this? It's g prime. So that is what a product does. If I have the product of two functions, I would take the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. They both get a turn at taking the derivative of them. That is the product rule because we're so creative with what we call things. This is the product rule because it is the rule for what to do when I have the product of two functions. To be really honest, this does not reach its full potential until we learn something called the chain rule. I know you do. I know you do. Some of you guys, anybody never heard of the chain rule? You think it's part of that old song, working on the chain rule? All right. Uh, it's nothing to do with that old song. I love the chain rule. I, you, you know I would. And I try to show you in a more concrete way why it works the way this. So, so that's in our future. Some of you guys know what it is. And some of you guys are like, oh shit, look at their reaction. Oh shit. Stay calm. Right now, the product rule is lame. It is completely lame right now. It's the stupidest thing ever. But once I introduce the chain rule, the product rule will be like, oh, thank God, this, this is amazing. So for example, what I mean that is this. Let's do a concrete example of this, and then we'll head out. What if I had this function here? Uh, what are you going to do, Jeff? Uh, all right. This is dumb. Why would I leave it as a product, correct? We can't handle much more than this yet. So just just stay with me. 
Let's, let's apply the product rule. Let's pretend like this is a person who knows calculus but doesn't know that you could put those together. Okay, stay with me for a second. The derivative would be, I take the derivative of one, right, here's what the rule is. I take the derivative of the first, leave the second alone, plus leave the first alone, derivative of the second. Do you notice how I wrote the rule out and then I'm gonna do derivatives? This is huge. We're gonna learn more and more derivative rules which as much as you hate chain rule, would you rather do it with the limit definition? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. All the people that know the chain rule, you hate it. You want me to make you do limit definition instead? No, you don't, right? So relatively, you love it. You just do. It's still a shortcut. Um, I'm sorry, the rest of you don't know what chain rule is. I'm really sorry. Um, Somebody, let me stop for a minute. Is any, everybody, I know this is x to the eighth, correct? We know this. I just want to show you that, that, that this rule works. What is the derivative of x cubed? And what's the derivative of x to the fifth? 5x to the fourth. So don't I get 3x to the seventh? 5x to the seventh is? 8x to the 7th. Isn't that what it would be if I realized, oh, this is x to the 8th. What's its derivative? 8x to the 7th. So this is kind of a check to make sure that product rule actually works. These better be the same or else the product rule is shit. So just to show you an example, I know I said this was the last thing. This, you know, I lie. You should know this by now. If I had a problem, here's where the product rule really comes in handy. In fact, I gave you an example earlier, but let me give you a worse one. What if we had to do this? What if I had to take this guy's derivative? We, the product rule will help out a ton because then I don't have to multiply this out 11 times. I don't have to multiply this out 27 times. But I currently, we currently do not know how to handle a function inside of another function. We don't know what that is. That is the chain rules job. So I really want this to make sense. I can't see the full utility of product rule until we learn chain rule, which tells me what to do when I have a function inside of another function. That's what chain rule does. No idea if you guys are with me. All right, so next time, Oh, there's the magic phrase. Next time we'll do, uh, not surprisingly, next time we'll do quotient rule. What happens when I have two functions that are dividing each other? All right, and then we'll keep, we'll keep going. Okay. That's it, guys. Let me get back some stuff. Kayla.